This is Nick Chappell. I'm here with Carson James, and we're doing the Zeeman Effect Experiment at Physics 341 with Dr. Tom Bensky. This YouTube report includes the theory behind the Zeeman Effect Experiment, as well as the calculation of the Bohr magneton using the Zeeman Effect and a Pabe Pro interferometer. To begin our explanation of the Zeeman Effect, we'll consider the simple quantum mechanical case of an electron transition between two known energy levels. Here we have an electron that we've placed in the n equals 2 energy level. After some time, it will make a transition to the n equals 1 level, emitting a photon. The photon, of course, having the energy uh, equal to the difference in the energies between the two states. And we end up with an electron in the n equals 1 state. Increasing in complexity, we consider the cadmium atom. The cadmium atom is unique in that it has two singlet degenerate states outside of its filled 4D orbital. These two states uh, represent the 5S, 6D, and 5S, 6P states. Uh, these correspond to the 1D2 and 1P1 states in the alternate notation. As I mentioned before, these states are degenerate as that they have multiple quantum number states with identical energies. Under the influence of a magnetic field, these states split their energies according to the m quantum number. The 1d2 state splits into the plus and minus 2, plus and minus 1, and 0 states according to the m quantum number. And the 1p1 state splits into the plus and minus 1 and 0 states according to the m quantum number. This splitting of states in a magnetic field is known as the Zeeman effect and is the principal point of inquiry of this report. As with the simple example previously, transitions can be made between these states. However, these transitions must obey the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics. One of these fundamental rules is that uh, delta m is allowed to be either plus or minus 1 or 0. As you can see, groups of three transitions will occur based on the delta m of the particular transitions. Here, the negative one delta m transitions are shown. In addition, the zero and one delta m transitions uh, combine to make a total of nine separate transitions within the split energy states. The energy of each of these transitions is governed by the magnetic energy of the electrons. The magnetic energy in a magnetic field is given by the simple equation U is equal to negative the dot product of the magnetic moment M with the field B. The magnetic moment of an orbiting electron uh, with angular momentum J is given by uh, the magnetic moment is equal to negative the Bohr magneton times the ma uh, angular momentum divided by H bar. Substituting these equations, uh, we find that the magnetic energy is simply uh, equal to negative the Bohr magneton, uh, the, magnet er, the magnetic field dotted with the angular momentum divided by h bar. And if we simplify, uh, given the case that the angular momentum is in the z direction, which will be parallel to the magnetic field, uh, we get the simple result that the magnetic energy is negative the m quantum number, the Bohr magneton, times the uh, field strength. Since the groupings of each uh, delta m quantum number uh, transitions all are shifted by the same amount by the Zeeman effect, these uh, transitions will all have the same energy. Uh, therefore, the photons emitted by the three sets of three transitions will result in three distinct wavelengths. Using the difference in these three wavelengths with the known energy of each transition, uh, we're able to determine the Bohr magneton using sensitive optical equipment, which will be explained in the apparatus portion of this report. The optical system used is a Fabi Pro interferometer, a pair of parallel, highly reflective plates spread a distance t apart. Light incident on the second plate of the interferometer reflects and refracts with the boundaries. The reflected light then reflects upon the first plate and becomes re-incident on the second plate. The transmitted light for the two incidences have a path length difference 
and are allowed to interfere. This interference is or evident on the viewing optic as a bullseye pattern due to the cylindrical symmetry of the interference. Consider a single ring of the interference pattern. As the magnetic field increases, the energy of delta m equals 1 and delta m equals minus 1 start to separate. This is observed as a splitting of the ring. As the rings split, you see the delta m equals 0 ring inside, which is unaffected. However, the center ring is unneeded in the analysis, so a polarizing lens will be placed in front to block it out. The goal of the experiment is to determine the Bohr magneton. We do this by measuring the magnetic field of when the two split rings merge. To do this, we measure the magnetic field of when, they, well, of when the split rings first touch and of when the split rings first separate again. Taking the average of the magnetic field at these two positions, the magnetic field of when the lines would appear to be exactly overlapped can be deduced. This position corresponds to one half a free spectral range of the peripheral interferometer. A full free spectral range would correspond to when the lines appear to merge at the position of the initial uh, interference pattern. Using the fact that the merging of the lines corresponds to exactly one half a free spectral range of the peripheral interferometer, and a relationship between the energy and the frequency of the emitted photons can be developed. Substituting in the expression obtained for the energy of the electron, a relationship between the magnetic field strength and the Bohr magneton is developed. The data analysis primarily consisted of plotting equation 9 and using a linear fit to determine the Bohr magneton from the slope. The Bohr magneton was determined to be 10.28 plus or minus 0.72 times 10 to the negative 25th joules per Tesla. This falls within one and a half standard deviations of the accepted value. Overall, the experiment was a success. We uh, developed an acceptable value for the Bohr magneton based on our observations of the Zeeman effect interference uh, with the Fabry Perot. However, uh, as far as recommendations for the uh, lab, we did find adjusting the viewing telescope and um, fi creating a suitable image uh, to take data to be quite cumbersome and uh, frustrating at times. An additional system for uh, viewing the interference would definitely uh, go a long way towards improving both the accuracy and the um, usability of this particular experiment. Overall, however, we learned uh, quite a bit about the splitting of energy levels in a magnetic field and thereby the Zeeman effect.